consumer's identity. And with that, our moderator, Joe Shum. Right. Thank you very much, Sherwin. Um, let me just make one personal remark. Uh, for those of you who were here yesterday, I'm sure you'll agree, it was really an extraordinary day. I think it was extremely informative and not only educational, but edifying. I think we were all uplifted as a result of the exchange of ideas and being here together. I really think it was marvelous. And the experience continues today. As Sherwin mentioned, we're going to be dealing with the pivotal question upon which all else depends, and that is the question, why be Jewish? Um, our speaker this morning is Professor Joel Feinberg, and let me briefly introduce him. Um, Dr. Feinberg is local and loyal to the Detroit area. He, um, his loyalty was manifest in the fact that he was born in Detroit, um, and he was educated at the University of Michigan, where he got not, received not only his BA and his MA, but his PhD. Uh, since then, Dr. Feinberg had held appointments at Brown University, at Princeton, and at UCLA, and the Rockefeller University before becoming Professor Emeritus of Philosophy and Law at the University of Arizona. He has held editorial positions on numerous journals in philosophy and law, with current positions on the journal Legal Theory and Bioethica. Recent fellowships have included the Rockefeller Foundation's Humanities Fellowship and the Roman L. Phi Beta Kappa Professorship in Philosophy. He's received several academic prizes, including the first biennial Fred Berger Memorial Prize. And he's extremely prolific. He has written over 100 publications, including The Constitutional Relevance of Moral Rights, um, an article titled Not With My Tax Money, The Problem of Justifying Government Subsidies for the Arts, an Ongoing Debate, and Dilemmas of Judges Who Must Interpret Immoral Laws. He is also the editor of a four-volume work, The Moral Limits of the Criminal Law. Join me in welcoming Dr. Joel Feinberg. Thank you very much. Uh, up to now, we've talked about relations between three kinds of parties. Can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if we put the mic over here, we'll experiment a little bit. Up to now. Well, let me let me try a few sentences to see how they go. This is Well, up to now, we've talked about relations between three uh, different parties. One, an abstract hypothetical party called the non-affiliated Jew. Two, uh, an ethnic group, namely the Jews, from whom the non-affiliated Jew comes. And three, the broader national community, which absorbs not only this group, but other ethnic groups, too. We haven't talked much about the role of the third uh, party in all of this, and I'll talk a little bit more about it than other speakers have. That is to say, the role of the overarching comprehensive national community. Uh, it's inevitable that my remarks will be provoking. I, I, well, it's rather odd for me to think in a way of, of our problem, which is providing good reasons to this first party why he should strengthen his Jewish identity, become more of a Jew than he has been, uh, find value in all of this, and so on, uh, when really I am that, that party, and I should be thinking of the arguments you're giving me, the reasons you're giving me for becoming more of a Jew. Uh, what, I, what I say is bound to be provoking to some of you. I'm sorry about that, but I guess provocation is not a bad thing in a discussion of this sort, unless, of course, it's provocation in the legal sense, in which provocation is a defense of, so, of, of a kind to homicide. <laughs> Sounds so, like you don't push your luck. <laughs> well, there are many possible explanations. There are many possible explanations. Take the microphone, put it right up on his. Uh, it is. It is. Right there. Sure. 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 I think they're dead. 
they went to. Okay. We're going to get a hand. Um, well, I want to disagree with you what you just said. <laughs> satisfaction of what goes on there, including collective affirmation of theological doctrines they cannot accept. To keep these two types of motivations separate, I propose that we substitute the word disaffiliated for the more generic term unaffiliated. Then we can say that the disaffiliated person is unaffiliated for one kind of reason only, namely a dissatisfaction with something properly called religious. One example of religious dissatisfaction I have already mentioned, namely, namely disbelief of theological doctrine. I myself, insofar as I question some traditional theological teachings, may resemble some of these disaffiliated Jews. And I do have difficulty accepting certain traditional doctrines about God, the soul, free will, sin, and immortality. But if but if unhappiness with theological underpinnings and rigid taboos is the one and only one reason, the one and only one reason disaffiliated Jews ever sever their ties to their congregation, then there cannot be many of them. It is a mistake, I think, to assume that philosophical disagreement with traditional doctrines means that much to members in good standing of religious congregations. Most of them find their own ways to be religious without theology. Consequently, many people may doubt or reject theological dogmas and remain content with the religious institution that imparts them. Alternatively, one can accept theological teachings, yet sever connections for other reasons. The rabbi's sermons are too political or too conservative or too radical. These are no religious reasons at all. If one resigns because the rabbi is too boring, to tap the full emotional potential of religious ceremonies, or irritates one by mispronouncing the Hebrew, then in a sense, the reasons for dissatisfaction are religious, though they have nothing to do with theology. Disaffiliated Jews are a diverse lot, as diverse as the various reasons they might give for becoming unaffiliated. Some of them are orthodox or standard believers of an automatic kind, they do not doubt the formal teaching, but are moved by one of the world's strongest motives in add to action, namely simple boredom. They may explain why they never go to religious services by claiming that such services are boring and that religion in general, though the object of their respect, is just not a big thing in their lives. 
Or they may think of Judaism as a collection of stories with moral content, calling for literary criticism rather than philosophical analysis. These stories, compared with those in other religions, would be better or worse. That is, our stories would be better or worse than their stories, not truer or falser. So belief and denial are not as relevant resp responses to them. And then, of course, there are the High Holy Day Jews, whom we talked about last time, uh, yesterday, who, like World Series type of baseball fans, restrict their interest to the season's climax. <laughs> Others restrict their interest to the cycle of biological seasons, birth, the onset of puberty, marriage, and death. Ceremonies and rituals at the time of life's critical junctures fulfill genuine emotional needs. Usually one can find such ceremonies satisfying without cognitive acquiescence in underlying theology. But cognitive distraction can sometimes spoil everything as when a funeral turns into just another occasion for praising God for his kindness, or a, marriage, or a marriage ceremony provides the bride with a pledge to obey her new husband. And if even reform temples do not please the free-thinking dissenter, there is always Rabbi Wine in his temple. One would think that such an array of facilities would just about cover the range of purely intellectual needs, so that there need be no disaffiliated Jews at all. Nevertheless, the person who is a disaffiliated Jew for theological reasons may well wonder what further reason there might be for taking his ethnic Jewishness seriously, his or her ethnic Jewishness. Having abandoned his belief or her belief in certain theological doctrines, let us suppose, he might well wonder what is left of his Jewishness once he subtracts the official belief system from it. Why be Jewish at all, he might wonder, if not for the usual religious reasons. At the time he stops being a member of an organized congregation, the Jewish uh, uh, disaffiliate will probably still be a member of the Jewish ethnic group. It is time then that we examine the distinction between an ethnic group and a religious institution. Whatever one's religious convictions, it is possible to drop out of, is it possible to drop out of anything so amorphous as an ethnic group? And elsewhere, in a part I'm not going to read, I distinguish in some detail between institutions and ethnic groups. A Jewish classmate of mine, and of Rabbi Wines, I believe, when we were all graduate students in philosophy in Ann Arbor 40 years ago, discovered firsthand how these concepts can generate confusion. The classmate was deeply in love with a non-Jewish woman. His mother was adamantly opposed to what she called a, quote, mixed marriage. The student replied, but mother, this will not be a mixed marriage. We studied philosophy together, and we have concluded after hundreds of hours of detailed conversation that we see eye to eye on all questions of theology and the philosophy of religion. We are both atheists. <laughs> atheist, atheist, his mother replied, if you must marry an atheist, then marry a Jewish atheist. <laughs> Some of you may find the phrase Jewish atheist linguistically odd. <laughs> you, you, might compare it, you might compare it, for example, with the statement, if you must marry a Catholic, then at least marry a Protestant Catholic, <laughs> said by an outraged Protestant parent, say, in Belfast. Or if you must marry a Christian, then marry a Buddhist Christian, said by an outraged Buddhist parent. No one can find a Buddhist Christian, of course, because there aren't any. And the reason why there are none is that there are central doctrines in the two faiths that contradict one another. For a person to hold both would be for her to believe a logical contradiction, Jewish atheist, uh, logical contradiction, sorry, period. Jewish atheist escapes the contradiction because the word Jewish is ambiguous. In one sense, it refers to a religion, and in the other sense, to an ethnic group. This, of course, is quite familiar to all of you, discussed in the detail yesterday. So we can interpret ju uh, Jewish atheist in such a way that it does not stand for a contradiction. We can refer by this term to a member of a certain ethnic group, the Jews, who rejects various religious tenets of Judaism. That is no more contradictory than the expression Albanian Catholic. Most Albanians, of course, are Muslims or the expression Christian Arab. If we continue to use the word Jew as a stand-in for an ethnic group, only one of its two legitimate meanings, 
We can even refer to Jewish Jews, that is, to those members of the Jewish ethnic group who also believe in the doctrines and faithfully observe the practices of the Jewish religion. There is nothing contradictory about that, nothing totalitarist about it either. A Jewish Jew is not like an Albanian Albanian. We can at least we can at least make up a plausible meaning for the former, but not for the later latter. The kind of ambiguity shared by the English words Jew, Jewish, and their cognates is virtually unique to those words, I think. I cannot think of another pure example except possibly the so-called Muslim Muslims residing in Bosnia, where, as you know, uh, ethnic identities are, taken, are not taken lightly. Uh, but a, a Muslim, 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 the word Muslim in, in Bosnia stands for a religion, the same one that is practiced in Saudi Arabia. It also stands for a group of people, an ethnic group, the Muslims, the same word. And apart from that example, I can't think of another uh, example of a phrase that's ambiguous in the manner of Jewish. Well, I'm going to skip my pronouncements on the subject of what is an ethnic group. I recommend an elementary text in anthropology or sociology. Uh, now, in, in my longer original paper, I try to describe some of the considerations that come as reasons either pro or con, for the advice we finally make to or about the disaffiliated Jew. I conclude that these reasons are either duty reasons or benefit reasons. If we talk about restoring meaning and the sense of connectedness to individual human lives, and the sense of belonging, and the sense of having roots, and all of that, we are mentioning what we think are benefits to the disaffiliated Jew we are addressing. If we cite the richness of Jewish civilization, we are mentioning benefits for the whole world. Uh, a reasonable person in the role of decision maker, though, in the role of this disaffiliated Jew, will not only consider likely benefits and harms for the individuals and groups likely to be affected by his decision, he will also consider whether his social role or his past promises and commitments Uh, have imposed upon him a duty so that he might, there might be nothing really obvious for him to gain by uh, increasing his Jewish uh, identity, but it might be his duty to do so anyway. And I have a long section on the notion of a duty and how we could have a duty to be more Jewish than we are now and to whom that duty might be owned. Uh, uh, it's rather complicated and too long, but it does, uh, well, let me just add another thing. Uh, or I can speak in a mixed way, neither entirely about benefits nor duties, by judging that if I, if I uh, do not sever or weaken my Jewish identity, then I am denying and disowning my own heritage and the person I am, my sense of self, the benefit <coughs> loss in this remark, is one kind of reason. And there is the reference to those who have passed on their heritage, in, uh, it, which is hardly on a way of honoring them when you behave in this way. So disowning a heritage is not a way of expressing high regard for the transmitters. Uh, and probably we have a, a duty in, in cases like that not to do so. At least that would be a kind of reason to be taken seriously for strengthening one's Jewish ties, even in the absence of religious conviction. So if, if we have a duty to remain Jews and intensify and strengthen our Jewish ties, then this, uh, is, this is a kind of trump card. It, uh, whatever reasons there are on the other side, duty tends to trump the other kinds of reasons. Now, when I talked with some of my Jewish students before coming here about the topic, I found a surprising percentage of them responded in the same way. I don't know if this is true to your experience also. What my Jewish students say in large numbers is that if I abandoned my Jewish ethnic life, played down my Jewishness, et cetera, et cetera, it would be to betray 
the victims of the Holocaust and show disrespect for their sufferings. One girl said, my grandparents did not go through all of that suffering escaping the Holocaust for nothing, end quote. Others use the expression that I think the, the locus classicus of which is Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address about how he hoped the Civil War victims shall not have died in vain. And with this argument goes the conception of our uh, victims of the Holocaust dying in vain, provided the world they thought they were dying for does not come about because of the voluntary decisions of their descendants. That's an argument I think deserves to be taken very seriously. I have things to say about it, but they're too long to say it right now. Thank you. The silence you hear is not the microphone's fault, it's mine. Now, uh, what, I've, what I think I've been talking about up to now is the kinds of considerations, the kinds of considerations that count as reasons uh, in this discussion. And there are at least two kinds, the duty reason and the benefit reason. They're not necessarily at one another's throats. They're, they're capable of coexisting, uh, although one of them tends to trump the other when they conflict. Now, uh, now I want to turn to the discussion as it takes place in the wider uh, con congregation of our, our country as a whole. Look at the way the debate has gone on there, where people talk about such things as separation, assimilation, integration, relations with other groups and Jews, relations with the comprehensive national community, and so on and coin various terms that insult one another in the debate of these matters. That's what I'm turning to now, on the assumption that we've at least got some vague acquaintance now with what counts as a reason. In the course of discussing these issues thoroughly, American Jews have even invented their own vocabulary for describing the views of Jews who differ from them. Those who advocate more open and cooperative association with non-Jews are frequently called assimilationists by their opponents. And those who advocate more inward focus on distinctively Jewish objectives and traditions are sometimes called isolationists or separatists by their opponents. Both of these labeling terms, assimilationists and isolationists, are derogatory. Often they refer to an opinion we accuse another party uh, of having. It is no compliment to be told, for example, that the conduct you advocate would uh, be quote unquote total assimilation, and that is a way of saying cultural extinction, or that it would amount to a kind of self-imposed segregation, in quotes, that is to say isolation would amount to a kind of self-imposed segregation. These are not compliments, these are not things that any of us would want to advocate explicitly. Because assimilation and isolation are inherently derogatory terms, or condemnatory terms, it is unlikely that a person would use either of them as a proud label for his or her own views. When nonetheless a partisan debater calls herself a separatist or equivalently an isolationist, I take her to be advocating a step in the direction of total isolation, not advocating that we go all the way to the end of the line in that direction, which would be absurd. It is as if a motorist, after asking a stranger for directions to his destination, is told in what direction to drive but not how far to go in that direction. If told to go west, it would be absurd for him to drive in that direction until he hits the Pacific Ocean and salt water begins to bubble into his car. Similarly, it would be absurd to advocate total assimilation as the final destination of the Jewish ethnic group, for that would be a kind of cultural extinction, and hardly anybody wants that. Similarly, hardly anybody, not even so-called isolationists or separatists, advocate driving all the way to a point of total isolation from the non-Jewish world. That would be an absurd destination that no one wants. Certainly not the responsible Jews who advocate only that we move cautiously for a little bit in that direction, for which opinion they are often unfairly given the misleading label isolationist or separatist. 
The word integrationist, which is the label for the view I tend to favor myself, does not have the difficulties of the other two, and is likely to have special appeal for the philosophical liberal. Some of the luster still remains from the golden age when liberal was not considered a dirty word. Do you remember when the word integration among liberals stood for a great and noble ideal? Liberals argued then, as some of us still do now, that burdens and benefits in our society, insofar as it is impractical to try to distribute them with absolute equality in all groups, should be distributed according to individual merit instead, but that equality of reward is to be fair. If it is to be fair, this requires equality of opportunity. If the members of a particular racial group are kept unfree to buy their own homes to enjoy the fruits of a good education and decent employment, but instead are restricted to highly segregated neighborhoods and prevented from having access to decent schooling and good jobs, then justice cannot be done. The key term in this statement of liberal faith, perhaps, was equal opportunity, words expressing a social ideal that is fulfilled in a great society only when those with power, both in the private and public domains, act as if they were colorblind toward those they deal with. Integration is a sort of middle way between forms of social involvement, and is especially easy to contrast with the views that are understandably labeled assimilationist or isolationist. Speaking now only of the Jewish ethnic group, we can paint a very simple picture of neighborhoods, school classes, and jobs. An assimilationist neighborhood is one that has no ethnic Jews at all, and at least anymore. An isolationist neighborhood is one that has only ethnic Jews in it. Numerous temples and synagogues, delicatessens, kosher, kosher shops, community centers, but no headquarters of other ethnic or non-ethnic kinds. An integrated neighborhood, in contrast, would have Jews and non-Jews in it, not in exactly equal numbers, but in proportions that roughly approximate their percentages in the larger community. Those who are called isolationists or separatists usually have very strong Jewish self-identifications, even when unsupported by a religious foundation. If we can distinguish between those who think of themselves as Americans who just happen to be Jewish, and those who think of themselves as essentially Jewish, who just happen to be American, they are clearly in the latter group, that is, Jews, Jews who just happen to be American. Indeed, it is not easy to swim against the stream of popular culture in this country where baseball and basketball began and jazz and rock and roll and where democratic political conflicts are so strange and fascinating and fun to think and talk about. Where these activities fill one's thoughts, it is difficult not to define oneself as essentially American. In any case, I do not judge that it is better to be a Jewish American than an American Jew, or better to be an American Jew than a Jewish American. I don't see how such judgments can escape arbitrariness. Now, this is part seven. The disaffiliated American Jew who is most likely to be charged with isolation is familiar to all of us. Among the many such people in my acquaintance, I have known middle-aged adults who have never had a close non-Jewish friend, others who have passed up an emotional bar an exceptional bargain on what otherwise would seem to be to them a dream house, on the sole ground that there were relatively few Jews in the neighborhood, those who have organized or joined professional societies for Jewish members of their profession, law, medicine, philosophy only, or have been in uh, Jewish college fraternities and sororities whose sole function seems to be to keep Jews and non-Jews of the same class apart. Similarly, golf clubs and other forms of voluntary segregation. Uh, and I also knew someone who once telephoned me to protest my giving my business to a competing non-Jewish businessman. Parenthetically, the business was an automobile repair garage my car had been badly damaged in a collision, which, as luck would have it, occurred only a quarter mile from the non-Jewish repair garage. Of course, I had no interest in determining his, or the owner's ethnic or religious affiliations. Blood was pouring down from my forehead. My, my attention was elsewhere. Besides, I was, quote, ethnic blind as a matter of liberal conviction. When I raised a verbal eyebrow about my caller's resentments, he replied cogently that Jewish history provides ample grounds for distrust of non-Jewish neighbors. I could not deny that. But it seemed to me that if in the long run, even in America, it is dangerous to be a Jew. 
then a kind of inbred isolation is not the most effective way of coping with it. It does not promote the good of the Jewish individuals who are rooted in their special enclaves, nor the good of the group as a whole, nor the good of the larger national community. It thrives on exclusion and separateness, ignorance and narrow subjectivity, moreover exclusively self-directed attention, though it can per perhaps promote knowledge and caring within the separated group, is likely to appear to the outside as clannishness, hatred of the outsider, sometimes called Balkanism or tribalism, and the division of all mankind into them and us. Part eight. If the disaffiliated Jew contemplates further moving out into the wider community from the ethnic group that has nourished her, she will come within range of the charge that she is, in the derogatory sense, an assimilationist, a person who can contemplate undisturbed the prospect not only of her own absorption into the prevailing non-Jewish culture, but also of the total absorption of the smaller group into the larger, with the resultant disappearance without a trace of the smaller one. Total assimilation would be a kind of cultural extinction. Extinction is a truly terrible term. The suffering that Jews have endured over the centuries in their fight to prevent extinction, both of the physical and the cultural kinds, is unsurpassed, and the bravery with which they have fought for survival is an inspiration. Still, survival is a value that must be understood and praised only after proper interpretation. There are two ways a group or elements of its culture can become extinct. One is the consequence of deliberate violence by its enemies, acting with the conscious intention of committing genocide. Our 20th century experience with such madness is still too fresh to be discussed without pain and outrage. The second mode of disappearance is neither tragic nor outrageous. At most, it is an appropriate occasion for shoulder-shrugging sadness. Some historians tell us that a once flourishing Jewish ethnic group in China has been, figuratively speaking, killed by kindness from a continued community, from a contented community which may once have numbered several hundred thousands the Jews began to disappear from Chinese life, though they were neither killed off nor forcibly converted. Rather, they were absorbed biologically and culturally in a slow but inexorable process. Today, only a few hundred are left, and they are descendants of later arrivals. This, the isolationist argues against the person he is likely to call the assimilationist, is what can come of, a, of Jewish departures from their own ethnic enclaves. It is to them, quote, unquote, the assimilationist nightmare. Sometimes extinction comes to human groups and their works by a process that is altogether different from forceful genocide. And this, I think, makes a more accurate model of any present danger. Something akin to biological evolution leads to a steady accumulation of small changes. The changes are gradual, not abrupt, but they can nonetheless produce in time, extreme changes in the characteristics that unite a random collection of animals into a species. No one kills off the earlier characteristics and replaces them deliberately with the new. Rather, the old set of characteristics, step by step, evolves into the new, every element of the change being voluntary and free of force. The group now, after several million years of these natural changes, has a different look. About, look. But no single individual has undergone abrupt and thorough change in his own person. And even the group as a whole undergoes no changes that do not promote adaptability or are unwanted. In fact, it is misleading to say that any group in evolutionary change has become extinct and then replaced by another one. Perhaps it is less misleading to say simply that the group or the species is still there, but much changed. Eohippus is now called horse and is much changed from its earlier ancestor. But in that long evolution from Eohippus to horse, no group was abruptly or cruelly extinguished. I think it is entirely arbitrary in this case whether we say that the early species is still here but very radically changed, or we say that Eohippus is gone and replaced through the process of continuous accretions into something new. There is a strong contrast here with the abrupt disappearance of the dinosaurs in the Cretaceous period and that of the Bengal tiger occurring right now with obscene rapidity. 
For another example of innocuous evolutionary transformations, we can leave the biological for the linguistic world, where we can observe evidence of the steady change and even eventual disappearance of a natural language. Again, we can talk about linguicide, again, if we want. Again, we might have a choice in describing this process between saying that an ancient language has gradually become extinct to be replaced by a new and different language, or we can say that no language in this history becomes extinct, but that they do become drastically different. But in general, the greater the continuity of linguistic change, the more likely we are to think of the subject of the changes, say the English language, as having survived the changes it underwent. Here the descriptive linguist, and I quote, Words are constantly being created and continually passing out of active use to be preserved in literature, which is dated by their very presence. Even the most familiar and commonly used words, which might be expected to be most stable, have a mortality rate of about 20% in a thousand years, end quote. Any natural language, according to this formula, will change its entire vocabulary in 5,000 years. But usually the rate of change is so slow compared to the turnover of human generations that no one is harmed by it, no chaos ensues, no people have ever been suddenly stripped of their mother tongue and rendered mutually incommunicated. If there is a danger that ethnic customs, cuisine, games, stories, literature from folklore and high poetry, all of that might suddenly be destroyed all because of natural linguistic evolution, and moreover, if there were a danger that not only the language, but the individual human beings who make up any given ethnic group might abruptly disappear, this would certainly constitute an embarrassment from my views. Can you imagine it? Suddenly there is no more exclusively Jewish religious institutions, no more Jewish professional societies, no more distinctively Jewish tastes represented in the marketplaces. Where did they all go, people ask? Have they all been arrested and shot? Have they been shipped to Siberia? The answer you then learn is that the ethnic individuals and the groups they make up are still here. They are simply not very ethnic anymore. By a huge coincidence, bagels have been losing their popularity, and similarly, lox and cream cheese. Six months later, however, bagels have been replaced by a new kind of roll invented by a Jewish baker, a roll that is similar to a bagel but not identical with one. The new kind of roll is so popular it replaces bagels in the public taste, even while at the same time the cost of making them becomes substantially less than the old bagels' production costs. The old bagels then become steadily less available until they are gone and forgotten decades later. Would this death of the bagels be a tragedy? I think not. <laughs> But now suppose, remember, I, I like the new kind better than the old, but now suppose a similar fate awaits other distinctive features of the Jewish ethnic group. All these cases, I suppose, would be occasions for sadness and regret, but there are some mitigating circumstances. These changes would violate no one's rights. It is not that the state has declared bagels illegal and threatened prison for anyone who sells or uses them, nor will there be any sudden wrenching disappearances. Perhaps it is sad even to speak about this strange hypothetical set of changes, but it is harder still to attach any likelihood to such a thing happening. And even then, if extinguishing changes did take place, they would be, in, the, in a sense, our own doing, therefore an expression of a group's voluntary acceptance. If even a small group were determined that such changes not happen, they could not happen. My mind, part nine, toward integration. There was a period in American history about a century ago in which assimilationism, if I'm running out of time, this will be the last one I read at the most, was assimilationism was not an unpopular theory, though I doubt whether the word assimilation ever had much popularity. The famous metaphor of the melting pot helped a bit. Imagine throwing into a pot your beef or lamb, your potatoes, onions and carrots, your curry powder with all its many spices and herbs and so on and on, replenishing with water and other elements whenever necessary. I must have been hungry when I wrote this. <laughs> if you kept a small flame going under the pot day after day, the product of your cooking would probably be a kind of broth, as the heat would break down the tissues of the meat and vegetables. Different procedures would produce not a broth, but a stew, what the French call a pot de feu. In a stew, individual chunks of meat and vegetables contribute their juices to the flavor of the whole, but nonetheless maintain their separateness. 
The stew, when it is served, has a greater diversity of distinguishable elements, each with its own individual character. No full assimilation, no isolation or separate serving of individual ingredients. The integrationist is the great stew cook. He is never so crude as to destroy the very elements he cooks, yet a unified flavor emerges from the separate individual elements. The broth is richer than ever, but the individual elements maintain their integrity. This metaphor is more appealing, I think, than that of the melting pot, both in politics and in gastronomy. <laughs> the integrationist urges ethnic group members to take their associates where they find them or where their intellectual, artistic, political, occupational, sporting, nature hiking, or other primary interests take them. Do not choose your associates only from your own kind, they tell us, as if that were even necessary or sufficient for friendship and collaboration. Do not appear to be eager to exclude non-Jews from professional societies or to give your business to relatively distant ethnic Jewish merchants, when more conveniently placed non-Jewish ones that are equally able to serve you. In summary, the integrationist principle would encourage among all ethnic groups a kind of ethnic blindness, on analogy with the color blindness we used to talk about when dealing with racial discrimination. <coughs> The integrationist is in a position to borrow arguments from the isolationist and assimilationist, the ones they use against one another, as well as the more positive arguments used by traditional philosophical liberalism. Against the isolationist, for example, he employs with special enthusiasm the liberal case for diversity. He admits that where there is little political freedom, relative isolation of an ethnic group can produce strength and strength makes survival possible. But there is, where there is freedom, Isolation loses this function. Jewish isolation in a democracy helps preserve rather than dispel vicious illusions about the Jews. If we deprive non-Jews of Jewish associations, we foster Gentile ignorance about Jews, and ignorance, which I think is astonishing, and ignorance leads directly to bias. On the social plane, it is isolation and ignorance, not familiarity, that breeds contempt. That was a nice last sentence to wrap up. <laughs> <laughs>